All right. Good morning, Doug. There's a bunch of stuff that I'd like to talk about today. Um, number one, I think we should address the game stock situation a little bit. I want to talk about the, the geopolitics, um, you know, what's going on now. We, 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 we were talking earlier about the, there, there's like a new Arab Spring likely to happen. There's because of the costs of food going up and all the problems that are out there. So I want to talk about that. And then I, I want to spend a little time talking about homeschool as well. So let's start off with the, the, the GameStop stuff. I know you haven't had a, a lot of time to, to take in all the news that happened with this in the last you know, 24 hours, but there's a ton. And let me just kind of recap a couple of things. Essentially, there's some Reddit traders, a board uh, called Wall Street Bets, a subreddit on Reddit, which now has, um, I think it's got 5 million members now. It had 4.2 million yesterday when I first looked. Um, I'm a member of it, have been for you know maybe a year or so. And um, it's interesting. They aren't all dumb people on there. There are some really good analysis that's done of some of the companies. So it's, of course, it's some people who don't know anything, but there's a lot of people who do know stuff that are on there and are doing reasonable analysis. Um, in any case, they uh, got behind GameStop essentially to create a short squeeze um, that, you know, because they were 140% of the stock was shorted. I mean, the, these hedge funds got way in over their head shorting it. And so they came in on the other side of the trade. And then it's just been, um, it's been piled on by more and more retail investors, ultimately resulting in many billions of dollars of losses for these hedge funds. Basically, that wealth almost transferred right to these retail investors. And um, Wall Street then started freak out about it. The, the financial media really freaking out about it. Regulators talking about how we have to do something. And a lot's happened since then. And, and um, uh, one of the biggest things, I just, uh, just to, to finish up my recap here, is that um, we're seeing the deplatforming of these threats to the establishment in the same way the deplorables were deplatformed. So like how Amazon Web Services denied service to Parler, Robinhood now has denied the ability to trade not just GameStop, but all of these uh, what they call meme stocks, including like AMC is another one that's there, and just not allowing trading at all on them. They don't need the regulators to pull it because the private companies are doing it on their behalf. So what are your thoughts on this whole GameStop situation based upon what you, what you do understand about it? Well... The stock market has actually become a casino. Uh, you know, a few people remember that um, it wasn't so long ago that the uh, the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, just when I just when I got into the business, when I started doing this stuff, you know, at first it was a big day when, or a normal day when the uh, New York Stock Exchange was trading eight, 10 million shares, normal. And then it moved up to 15 and 20 and then 40 million share days became a big deal. And now the numbers are off the scale. I mean, hundreds of millions. I mean, where is all this volume coming from? And uh, what it's a sign of actually, this immense amount of trading is the financialization of the US economy. And how did that happen? It came, it came to be because of all the money being printed by the Federal Reserve. And it's basically all gone into the financial markets. They didn't, you know, hedge funds used to be, you know, rare and unusual things. There weren't many of them. Now they're everywhere like poison mushrooms. Mm. It just means that too many people have too much money and they're interested in, in, in buying and selling stuff. It's like this old joke. Hello, New York, buy. Hello, Chicago, buy. Hello, Los Angeles, sell. New York and Chicago are buying. So <laughs> same guy giving the orders. Yeah. So uh, it's pretty much gotten like that uh, today. It's a sign of a really long-term top in the markets. And it's not, we can talk about all these individual things that you mentioned in addition, but that's kind of like my opening argument is that the buying and selling of stocks as a business, it can be good if you're a clever researcher or a clever trader or a clever speculator. And of course, speculators and traders and investors and gamblers are four completely different kinds of animals. 
But uh, frankly, uh, the whole purpose of a stock market is to raise capital for productive businesses. That's it. Uh, it's a place where you can go and get people to give you money for something that works. And an aftermarket is there just to provide liquidity for the people that need to sell or new people that didn't get in on the deal and want to buy afterwards. They can That's it. So all this trading today is, uh, it, it's, actually, it's actually pointless. It's just paper shuffling. It's, it serves no useful purpose. Uh, but it, and, and it's got to end in a disaster. That's, that's my bottom line. Well, the whole market is the aftermarket at this point. I mean, really, I mean, it's uh, all the trading, everything. If you watch CNBC, almost, unless it's an IPO, um, which, you know, those haven't been happening that often right, lately, it's all basically about the price movements in the aftermarket, which is, has nothing to do with providing capital to the companies. It's no. just the trading. And to add to your idea, uh, your, the thing you were saying about, um, you know, that it's, it's uh, just the, it's just this, it's not, it's more speculation or gambling now versus, you know, what would be considered investment before where you're actually giving capital to a company and expecting kind of return on it. The average hold time for, for a share of stock I heard this morning is 40 seconds. 40 seconds. Yeah. Well, that's, that's because, that's because of these hedge funds that, you know, I'm not even sure how this works where they're, you know, uh, trying to get as close as they possibly can to the trading floor so they can get a microsecond advantage on the next guy and quant trading, which I guess a computer is programmed to, to read a chart and try to figure out what's gonna happen next. It, it's all a formula for disaster. I mean, it's, it's just a sign of the times. It, it, it's a huge wastage of capital because none of this stuff produces anything. There's, there's room, there's always room uh, in even a, you know, a genuine capital market where you're raising money for companies and the aftermarket's there. So some, some people want to buy them and some people want to sell them, fine. Uh, but that should be a teeny weeny part of the economy. Uh, not today where people are spending huge amounts of money trying to in trading banks, trying to second guess and outguess each other. This is all completely non-productive of any real wealth. It's, it's an inevitable consequence, however, of the financialization of the economy, which is a consequence of the government needing to create lots of money just to keep its head above water. And the Fed making it easy to borrow money from banks, allowing people to think that they're richer than they are. And if they think they're richer, they act richer. You don't buy a, a, a used Ford, you buy a, a new Lamborghini, right. which is the kind of car incidentally that most of these people buy. I wouldn't own a Lamborghini if my life depended on it. I love the early Lamborghinis, the Mira P400, and the 350 and 400 GT, the first cars that the maestro made back then. But now, nobody but a nobody but a, a, a pimp or a drug dealer would own a Lamborghini. Anyway, this is one of the one of the more distant consequences of, of creating right. fun money. You know, the thing. One of the things that's interesting is you know this this whole system that is that is fraudulent, it seems, or not fraudulent, but it's, a, it's an abstraction of reality, if nothing else. It, it's, it's made a lot of people enormously wealthy. And I think what's, what's amazing about this is that, to me, this whole thing is when you had all these uh, retail investors who probably their average trading account size might be two or three thousand dollars, okay? You have legions of these people trading against, um, you know, a couple of very well-known Wall Street short shops. And, and, and the Wall Street uh, hedge funds get crushed by these guys and they freak out. Like it's a huge problem for them. And, um, you, know, and on, you know, you have all in one day, all these different regulators coming on CNBC, all these different talking heads coming on CNBC, you know, some of them sounding like, you know, d depressed. I wrote an article about this yesterday. It was like it featured this one guy, Herb Greenberg, who was, uh, you know, was a CNBC guy back in the day, but now he has his own, he sells short, 
advice basically to hedge funds. And he looked depressed, like he was going to jump off a building. I mean, he looked really, really like it was, it was hurting him uh, very seriously. And meanwhile, it's just all these, you know, dopey guys. Uh, there's what the way they actually, re- I think they refer to themselves as degenerates. Actually, they call themselves degenerates <laughs> on this board, you know, um, you know, they're making a uh, life changing money. Some of them, I mean, I, I, there's the guy who originally came up with thesis on this trade as of yesterday, he updates his, his current, you know, what he's at. He, his investment was 50,000. His, the, his, the trade was worth as of yesterday, more, yesterday, maybe noonish, 47 million. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. And he, well, I can he, see how that can happen because a, uh, you know, a sound financial a- analyst, and I haven't looked at GameStop. I, I like to, you know, I haven't looked at the balance sheet and income. None of that. I don't know anything about it. I don't follow those kind of stocks. But uh, it was pretty cheap, wasn't it? I mean, the stock was, let's say it was trading $2. And, and, and it, let's say this guy can see clearly this baby's going to zero, okay? So you, you short a whole bunch of stock at $2, a whole bunch. And then since it's a cheap stock, the retail public goes in, $4, $6, he gets more short. And, and they keep driving it higher. And by the time it gets to 100, because these people have no idea of value, now he's got a cover. He's got to buy back all that stock that he sold. So yeah, I can see how you could make this kind of money. It's, it, it's, it's, yeah, I'd say at this point, at this point, following the, the crazy public who finds stocks like that, the people are, that are low priced and people are heavily short, it's a great play. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, it is I wonderful. Some of the hedge fund guys, absolutely. Even though they're right, and I totally agree with their analysis. Yeah, absolutely. But the way it's going to work out is, is these guys that make a lot of money. It's, it's like, I mean, it's really funny. I read something uh, the other day where one of these guys, one of the public members of the public that have made a lot of money was asked, how do you do it? How do you do it? He says, look, it's actually pretty simple. I wait until a stock is going up. I buy it. When it stops going up, I sell it and I buy another stock. Well. <laughs> yeah, that's sounds pretty easy. It really is pretty simple. <laughs> Why isn't everybody a billionaire? So, well, the thing is, if you can coordinate these efforts, like if you can, just like if you, just like you, you, there were three major hedge funds that were in the short position against GameStop, you know, trying to drive it down, and you know, they all knew each other, and so yeah. just coordinated their activities, you know, to do this, and like, and maybe, maybe it's all public, and they can see it, and they know, you know, maybe it's, I'm not saying that they there was collusion or anything that my, I'm not quite saying anything illegal, but on the other side, on the, where you have millions of members of a Reddit forum, and somebody keeps, you know, keeps touting this uh, this trade, you know, and then you know it gathers momentum there, and then other people see it and they pile in. It's not collusion there either. It's not collusion there either, and you know you can if you get enough money in that trade though you can really swing it and that's what these hedge funders have known for a long time that's how they've made all their money is by being able to do that now the idea that the public could do it the the, the plebs is terrifying i think to the shrine in wall street yeah that's that's right and i'm sure when they saw the public was moving into the a, a company that should be bankrupt you know they said this is wonderful we can we can take all these idiots to school right. and Turned out that they were they were they were trying to fight against a tsunami. Exactly. It didn't matter how smart and how much how rich they were. Right. So very interesting. And the other thing that's really important to, to to mention about this whole phenomenon is it is about making money. Obviously, you know the guys who come up with these trades and are and are you know proposing them, you know in this Reddit forum are certainly trying to make money, but this has become something about way more than about money to a lot of them. And let me just read one of the guys who, uh, who one of the posts I saw in there yesterday, this guy um, says, I was locked out of my broker, but it doesn't matter. Price is still going to the moon. Honestly, this, this is no longer about the money. It's the true Occupy Wall Street, the true reckoning. Trump tards thought that incriminating themselves by storming the Capitol was a revolution. Fucking idiots didn't know shit. This will make the man tremble. You guys look at it as like, I don't even care if I lose money. I mean, a lot of them say, I don't even care. It's only 300. I don't, mine's only $300. I don't care. And there's, but there's hundred thousand of them and they don't care. 
Yeah, well, this is, you know, in the future, this is going to be written about. It's, it's uh, another sign of the bell ringing at the top, but there have been bells ringing at the top now for a long time. And then there's another bell, bigger bell ringing. So this is really gonna be one for the record books when it melts down. The Fed's gonna to have to print trillions of dollars and probably buy stock directly itself, which incidentally, the Swiss National Bank, the Japanese National Bank, they're huge stockholders. They buy stock right in the market. Uh, why are they doing that? Uh, to, to defend financial interests that are, who knows? The whole system is so corrupt at this point. It's hard to see. And I think, you know, if you think, if people, one of the things that I love about this is that if, if people believed in a free market, that the markets were actually open and fair, or whatever, I think that millions of people were disabused of this idea to over the last 48 hours as, you know, they've been essentially deplatformed, unable to trade, you know, and, and it's very clear that it's because some hedge funds were just on the wrong side of it. They were getting crushed. And so, you know, everyone comes automatically to the defense. So I love how it's opened that up, but at the same time, it hasn't been really a free market for a long time. You talked about the yeah. Fed already. You know, I mean, I, when, right before the pandemic hit, I, um, um, you know, I, I did an options trade relating to this, uh, you know, the high yield debt. I'm like, this is going to blow up. So I did an options trade around that, but then, and it was working. It was really good. I mean, I was you know, way up in the trade and I took some money off the table but then the Fed came out and announced that they were going to buy, you know, high yield new high yield issuances. So they like they like stepped in to like keep that whole whole thing from blowing up already. And I think that this is what we can expect to see this in every part of the market over time. Yeah, and then of course there is the um, proliferation of SPACs today, special purpose acquisition companies, of which there are, I think I saw there are about. 250 or so that are listed on NASDAQ or the NYSE. And between these 250 of them, they have something on the order of $100 billion. So this is really big money. I mean, look, we've had these things. I've always played around in the Vancouver market for many reasons in the past uh, and present still. And uh, half the stocks up there are, what they are is they're called shells, cashed up shells. Uh, I guess SPAC sounds more legitimate, a special purpose acquisition company, as opposed to a, a shell. And then a promoter cuts a deal, makes a big private placement, controls it, and, 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 and hopefully jams the stock by peddling it to the public for outrageous prices. So it's another bell ringing at the top of the market. It's some. Um, Charles McKay in his book, um, Great Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, or words that are extraordinary delusions and the madness of crowds. He's got a line there uh, describing uh, what happened during the South Sea bubble <clears throat> of the 1720s in England. And one promoter who was floating a stock, this is a long time ago, 300 years ago, uh, his prospectus, and of course there was no SEC or anything back then, and the SEC itself, I've got to say, uh, is should be abolished because it should be renamed the Swindlers Encouragement Commission because it makes the average, the average guy think, oh, I'm protected. The government's looking out for me. But as you pointed out, the SEC is complicit with these people because you work for the SEC for, a, I'll go back to what I was talking about the South Sea bubble in a minute, but I didn't want to forget to say this. The average, the average um, lawyer that goes to work for the SEC does so, unless he's, unless he's a maniac, uh, goes to work for the SEC for a couple, three years, five years, to get, make connections within it, see how the system works, and then goes to a, a big, securities firm like White and Case or somebody like that and starts hauling down a million dollars a year on the it's it's all a scam it's all a scam and, and it serves and it does nothing but increase costs uh, put more sand in the gears and increase costs for the actual raising and trading of capital I right. mean the SEC is it's Swindler's Encouragement Agency but anyway going back to Charles McKay he said um, 
uh, this whole prospectus said uh, the money was to be used for uh, a venture of, let me see, I ought to quote it. A venture of great advantage to all concerned. And that was all you needed to know. That's your money here. It's going to be a venture of great advantage to all concerned. You know, so it's getting that way. That's what these SPACs basically are. I don't know if you know, but they launched an ETF for SPACs last year. <laughs> And it's, it's just, it's just, that's like an option on an option on an option. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a daisy chain. This is just amazing. And these things will all go down like, like bubbles. And there aren't that many good deals out there for SPACs to buy, quite frankly. And, and where's the management? I mean, after the SPAC buys out the old company and the old management makes a lot of money. A lot of these guys are going to make so much money, they're going to say, you know, screw this. I'm going to do something else with my life. Yep. So it's, it's all going to end badly. It is. It is going to end badly. And, um, you know, but I, I do at least like it that the that the average guy is taking it to these hedge funds. I mean, there's just the schadenfreude yeah. in me about all this. I just can't, you know, it's, it's, it's real. Schadenfreude is real. It's the best thing I can say about it. Well, yeah, I, it, it's not... Schadenfreude, you say, well, that's kind of an ugly emotion. But on the other hand, when you see somebody get what they deserve, that's nothing wrong with that. Because sometimes I like to see people get what they deserve. Some people get good things, they deserve it. Some people get bad things, they deserve it. So yeah, I think Schadenfreude has, a, has an unjustly besmirched reputation. Yeah, I think so too. I think, I think you can be a petty person and, you know, want to want people to, you know, suffer and have injury, but like wanting a little justice in the world or a little bit of, you know, uh, people to experience their comeuppance. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't think. Yeah. Well, it'd be nice to see some, some justice in the world. If you want to go along a commodity because there's a shortage of it, uh, justice, I'd say there's as much shortage of justice as there is of, uh, of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a rare element where we don't have enough of it, but common sense. Yeah, common sense. Yeah, it's just it's just absolutely amazing. So, so speaking anyway, of, you know, I think about these things and I say, well, God, the bell's ringing, uh, but I hope this bubble goes on for a while because I like good times, even if they're artificial good times, more than real bad times. Let's admit it. Absolutely. So before the, you know, before the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, break through the windows on this, you know, party, uh, and uh, you know, slay everybody. I hope it goes on for a good long time. Frankly, yeah, I don't me. care if I'm living in a dream world. If the dream goes on forever, maybe it doesn't make any difference. Exactly. I remember in 2008, you know, when when all that happened, I thought we were at the end. You know, then I thought it was just going to, you know feed on itself negatively and just kind of everything collapsed and we were going to be there. And it's been a yeah. wonderful blessing to have these last 12 years. And if we could have another dozen somehow pulled out of it, that would be wonderful. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it, it, it's like a 95 year old man finding the fountain of youth. I mean, thank you, Jesus, for, for the Fed doing incredibly stupid and destructive things. If they let the whole thing collapse, <clears throat> It would have been an ugly few years, but you know things might be fairly normalized right now and productive. We wouldn't be sitting on the edge of a razor. Yeah. What will happen this time? If it collapses this time, it's going to be predictably a much bigger mess than it would have been if they let it collapse in 2008. And it doesn't matter because when it collapses this time or if it collapsed the last time, it's just going to be an excuse for the kind of people that are in Biden's regime to really lock the economy down. So a collapse should be a good thing, but it's going to turn out to be a really extra double ugly thing because of what these people will do in response. Right. And the, and the things that they're doing to try and prevent it, to, to try and uh, keep the weakness of the system from being exposed, like deplatforming people who say things they don't like or, or who are, that are that words are threatening um, somehow. Uh, they're removing them where 
individuals or can't get access to make their $300 trade because there's too many of them in the end that'll take down the system, you know, if, they, if they're allowed to trade. Um, I mean, I think there's really no limit to how they will change the rules midstream and how they will cut people off. And so there is no, you have to be very careful of that. You have to be very aware that the rules change randomly and to the benefit of those that are trying to keep the system, even if they think they're doing the right thing, whether they're doing the right thing, whether they're doing it with the intention of doing the right thing or the wrong thing, um, you know, they will change the rules arbitrarily to the, to the benefit of the existing regime. You know, whatever. absolutely. And interestingly, uh, you know, Simon Legree types that want to actually do wrong, or you know, Doctor Evil with the white cat. The fact is, is that almost everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, or at least has justified it in such a way that they're the good guy. Everybody, Stalin and Mao thought they were good guys. Hitler yeah. thought he was a good guy, you know, and, and they laid out their reasons for doing what they were doing. Yep. So earlier this week, we talked about stoicism and, you know, and other philosophies. And one of the basic ideas that I got from reading Epictetus was, which is, you know, one of the core well-known Stoics was the idea that no one engages in activity that they feel is wrong. Like they, like they really believe that. And so he believes ignorance is the problem. You know, that people just don't understand, you know, how they're, how they're harming things, but you know, people, no matter what act of evil you see someone do, they actually sincerely believe that they're doing something that is the right thing to do. It is the good thing to do. It's very rare that you find somebody who is actually has an evil idea and believes that they're acting in evil you know, instead of good. And that's even more dangerous. That's much more dangerous because there's certainty in the way that they- in Certainty, their... exactly. And, and I'm afraid Epictetus was wrong. I mean, I can understand how you could say ignorance is the problem, but, you know, as you just pointed out, the more educated people are, the more certain. It's, and anyway, you can't change people's minds about these things. It's, who was it? It was probably Mark Twain that said it's, it's easier to, it's easier to, it's harder to convince somebody that he's wrong than to convince them of the thing that makes them wrong in the first place, or words to that effect. It's easier to, once you convince somebody of something, it's much, much harder to deconvince them of it, quite frankly. Kind of leading back to what both Lennon and St. Ignatius Loyola said, you know, give me a kid until he's seven and I will, you know, for the rest of his life, I know where he's going to go. On that point, we should talk about homeschooling because, uh, because that goes right to this point. And we can, and we'll, I'm sure in questions in our Q&A tomorrow, we'll talk more about this whole situation with Robin Hood and GameStop and all that. But let's, let's talk about homeschooling because you sent me. Talk, but shouldn't we talk about homeschooling? That is such a huge subject using that template that we both looked at. I think. Could we even cover that in, a, in one session? It'll be very interesting to actually. Yeah. We could save that for another time if you feel like it's because we, we're going to go a long way with that, I guess. It will take us a while to get through it. I think we will. Uh, and I don't know if we can go much further with this. I mean, except to say that uh, I'm trying to figure out, you see, I'm most of, I'm mostly long commodities, uh, directly and indirectly, and especially gold mining stocks. Because I think, uh, if this bubble continues, it's going to flow into uh, it's going to flow into the uh, commodities. Really, well, actually, it's starting to flow into the commodities. Talking about that, because uh, soybeans are are in the teens now. Corn and wheat are both moving towards their previous highs of ten years ago, and. <clears throat> Okay, this is great for commodity uh, speculators, but people actually eat this stuff and their animals eat this stuff. Uh, case of soybeans and corn, it's mostly animals, but wheat, that's what people eat. And the um, color revolutions in the Arab world of uh, what, 10 years ago or something like that, basically started because wheat was too high priced and people couldn't afford it. So, uh, now is it's getting back up to those levels and probably going a lot higher, I think. What's gonna happen in these poor countries where they actually can't afford to buy bread, which is 
what they mostly eat, bread and pasta. So revolutions could start there. Well, they can be overthrown. Of course, the U.S. government will stick its nose into it wherever it is. There's tension everywhere, though. I mean, you see even in the Netherlands, they've had like three or four days in a row of riots you know, and um, protests in Amsterdam have gotten violent. I mean, they, they burnt down a COVID testing center in one of the cities in the Netherlands, you know, I mean, they're, they're, cause they're, they're, there's a lot of tension anyway. And when you add in these countries that these developing countries where they just can't afford food on top of all the other difficulty that, that take Egypt, you mentioned earlier, and one of the examples, which needs tourism badly, you know, in order for, for its economy it needs tourism badly, that's gone. Essentially prices gone. Are skyrocketing. It's just a tinderbox. It just seems like the the like it's just a matter of time, you know, that it's there's going to be a breaking point there. And I, it seems like it's if if, if we prices keep going up like this, then there's it's going to be sooner rather than later. That's right. In other words, take the Egyptians for instance. It's there's a there's a crazy country. I mean, you've got a hundred million people, and they're all living along the Nile River, river basically, and. Uh, the more people that reproduce, the less arable land there is from the river. And of course, the, uh, the floods that have nourished uh, Egyptian agriculture for thousands of years really no longer exist since the construction of the Aswan High Dam. So the soil is getting less fertile. So internally, Egypt doesn't look very good, frankly. and. Uh, as you pointed out, there's no tourism in Egypt. That was their major foreign exchange uh, earner. And the, the second thing is overseas Egyptians sending money back home. But with this COVID hysteria and slowdown in the world economy, those people, foreign Egyptians, can't afford to send much home to the family anymore. And uh, the Suez Canal, another major source of income, World trade slows down. Revenues from that are gonna slow down. So how are these people gonna support themselves? I mean, it's kind of a mystery to me anyway. And, and then we were talking about Haiti too, yep. which, is, which is probably even a worse example of that. Cause I first went to Haiti in a long time ago, 1971 or something like that, long time ago. And it was delightful. I, I thought, you know, I'd like to move here. And I was thinking I could set up a diving business and get involved in the Haitian art world, which was vibrant and excellent artists, just spectacular stuff. And the cost of living was extremely low. I mean, I, back in those days, dollar wasn't worth what it is now, of course. But I remember I stayed in this one ho uh, hotel in downtown Port-au-Prince where you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to walk there during the daytime anymore without a couple of bodyguards. The last time I was, isn't, wasn't Haiti, when I went out, it was with a couple of bodyguards and you needed them, honestly, dangerous place now. I, I don't say that lightly because most of these things about, oh, dangerous, they're mostly overblown bullshit, but this is not. So anyway, uh, uh, I stayed uh, in this place with, uh, what did I get? I guess as part of the deal, I got breakfast and lunch or breakfast and dinner. And, and it was fantastic food. It was French cooking by people that cared about the food. It was like five dollars a day. Wow. I mean, it was it was incredible. But now, I would say of all the countries in the world, Haiti may be the biggest shithole. Yeah. It's certainly in competition for that. It's not nice. Smart people have all left. Yeah, and it, well, you gotta. One of the things you mentioned about Haiti earlier, before we got before we went live, was that the um, you know the biggest export you think from from Haiti, what it, all it produces really is people, and so you got to imagine in a situation like that too, where you know food prices going up, the tensions, the social tensions, you know get get higher and higher, and like hot, it's there's got to be an you know an escape valve for some of that pressure, and it's hard to be. yeah. You know, I remember when I was there early on, first time, second time, I met the guy that uh, either owned or managed 
certainly managed if he didn't own it, uh, the baseball factory. And it turns out that at least in those days, all of the major league baseballs were made in Haiti. Made sense. It's hand labor, you got to sew these things, and, you know, skilled. And he hated it because he had all kinds of problems with the Haitians. But still, eventually, Haiti stopped making baseballs. I don't know where they're made now, but it just became too impossible because of all the corruption and the snafus and the electricity going off. And so that business left. I guess the Barbancourt rum business is still in Haiti, but I don't think there's anything else. Yeah. And Go ahead. I, I was going to say, you know, a, a lady who's a good friend of mine, I went there to Haiti with her the last time, has a charity in Haiti where she adopts, you know, kids that are starving and kids that have congenital birth defects and all this type of thing. And I said, Susie, listen, you're, you're just pissing into the ocean here. You're destroying your own capital and your own life, and you're not going to be able to help these people. And so anyway, she raised money. This is, you know, and of course, she's got wonderful stories about the Clinton Foundation and what was going on there with, uh, we, could have, we, could have Haiti, we could have Susie on here and uh, have her talk about Haiti because she's been running an orphanage in Haiti for <laughs> a decade, two decades now. She's got great stories. But what was I going to say about, oh, just one story of, of many. Uh, she imported a couple containers full of food and they were tied up at the port because of bureaucracy, which was impossible to get through. And by the time they got the food out, uh, it was all rotten in the heat and humidity. So mm. you, these people can't get out of the way to help themselves. And the government is totally and absolutely terminally corrupt. And, but that's true of so many governments around the world today. It's become a sauve qui peut situation where, where the rats are just trying to take care of themselves. That definitely seems like I'm going full circle back to the back to the Wall Street thing. Uh, certainly, that's yeah. they're circling the wagons, you know, to keep things to make to protect themselves from losses and to keep things going. And it certainly seems like that pervades, you know, the U.S. and probably the rest of the world too. I guess. I'm sure that the exchanges and the SEC are going to build arguments about how these. Uh, Robin Hooders have to be protected against themselves and how they're distorting the markets and blah, 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 blah. Yep. Yeah. I heard this guy said, a uh, guy talking head on CNBC yesterday, or maybe it was Fox Business, came on and said, um, you know, you know, I'm, uh, he says, 100% of all the regulations are designed to protect the small investor. They're it's, <laughs> he, said, he said, I have the registrations to prove it. You know, because he was a licensed FINRA, whatever guy, you know, so or, uh, so he was like, yeah, uh, you know, they're all there to protect, protect the normal people. And, you know, so they're, they're very important. And this is the priority of the SEC. And um, I mean, the question is, is was he a knave or a fool? Was he was he ignorant or evil? What was the predominant? It, Who knows? I just can't even imagine that he was he's that ignorant. Uh, you know, he putting himself out there on TV uh, yesterday with what's happening when the hedge funds are the only one getting hurt uh, yesterday. Now, of course, you know, some of the people who are obviously buying into this, this bubble of, of these stocks are going to get hurt because it's going to come back to earth at some point. They're going to get hurt. But um, it seems to me the only person that's been hurt, hurt so far was, was these big hedge fund billionaires. And that's... Mm why he would be coming out supporting, you know, making a big stink about it unless he were on their side. Yeah, at some point, maybe now, there are other hedge funds that watch this stuff closely and they have new pools of capital and they're looking to short this thing at the top now where it's not like shorting it at $2 for bankruptcy, it's like shorting it at $200 for bankruptcy. Exactly. And these poor little people are gonna get washed away because they don't understand what's going on. Right. <laughs> It's like anyone to sell to. Yeah. Oh, we need more regulations. We need a, a bigger budget at the SEC. And, oh, what a disaster this is going to be. It is a disaster, but in the meantime, we can enjoy the uh, the Schadenfreude of uh, somebody, you know, a couple people who basically had totally irresponsible over 
leveraged positions, these hedge funds, I mean, totally irresponsible for them to be have 140% of the stock short. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy that they would do that. So it's good to see, you know, these people get punished. And my guess is that all the other hedge funds out there had to see this, but they have kind of this gentleman's agreement. Well, we're not going to, we're not going to grind you, you know, into the dirt, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, maybe we'll do a little bit of trade, but we're not going to try and destroy you or else they wouldn't. Although although I'm sure once the trend got going, since these guys know everything, they probably piled on because, hey, listen, the tsunami's coming in. I'm going to surf it. Exactly. Yep. (laughs) I have no doubt. You know, and that's interesting that 140% of the existing shares were short because in theory, uh, you're only supposed to sell a share uh, if you can borrow it from somebody else. So these are what were called naked shorts. I'm not, I think it's illegal. I'm not opposed to it at all. I mean, if you want to take the risk, hey, that's, that's fine. That's, that's, that's great. But I think that just that in itself is, is uh, against the SEC's rules. To- it is, but yeah, I don't, you don't hear much talk about focusing on that part of the problem. You know, they, Instead, the focus is on how the, the manipulation that may be occurring on these message boards and in fact, uh, this guy who I mentioned earlier, Herb Greenberg, said uh, a couple of days ago, this was before yesterday when it got really crazy, he said, I mean, we don't even know who's on these message boards. It could be foreign actors attempting to create chaos in our markets. Jesus Christ. Use the uh, rest thing. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, I really, whoever Herb is, I really hope he goes bankrupt and has to grub for roots and berries in his, in his later years. He's living under a bridge. I mean, yeah. that's disgusting. It is. I mean, yeah. people say things like that. Oh, God. <sighs> All right. Well, I think we'll leave it at that for today. This was good. I appreciate the conversation. Lots of interesting things happening. Tomorrow we'll have our Q&A. And, um, and then we'll just plan on the homeschool one for maybe maybe uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week then. Yeah, exactly. That will be a uh, happy Tuesday as opposed to uh Thursday or whatever it is. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks.